Well, Christ so can I see on a key, no sweat thaw, a good bit of book here and newly had an hoilist in honor. Welcome to you all. I hope you and yours remain well and a sincere thank you, dear Twin Gallon, to all our alumni, staff, donors, friends, supporters for joining us today for an event. Understanding the crisis, young people's mental health, Diaz Arar Gavon, Yechid Medal, Pobli Bank. Just to say really swiftly that uh, today's digital showcase will be recorded and we will send you the link following the event and you're very much welcome to share that link um, as you feel appropriate. Venu you Damien Wolfer Davis. My name is Damien Wolfer Davis and I'm Deputy Vice Chancellor of Cardiff University and you're here tonight as part of a large Cardiff community comprising graduates who have finished their studies at Cardiff, friends, who are supporting the learning and research of the university to discover more about work happening at Cardiff University as part of the Wolfson Centre for Young People's Mental Health. Now, that's a research outfit that will soon be moving into our new Spark building on our innovation campus in Mandy Road, as I'm sure many of you listening know. And that's a space, an environment, and a culture indeed built specifically to enable interdisciplinary social science research with real world outcomes. And the Wilson Center was established in 2020. It deployed understanding of the causes of adolescent mental health problems, and importantly, vitally, crucially, to inform new effective ways to offer practical help to young people. So, to the main event, I'm delighted to introduce two colleagues, Professor Stefan Collishaw and Dr. Joanna Martin from the School of Medicine. And they're here to discuss the current research on the increase in young people's mental health problems, and also to look at a case study investigating the gender differences, very interestingly and troublingly, in the diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. Professor Stefan Collishaw is co-director of that center, the Wolfson Center for Young People's Mental Health, and his research examines population level change in young people's mental health and the factors that explain the recent increase in youth anxiety and depression. And his colleague, Dr. Joanna Martin, gained her doctorate at Cardiff and is a research fellow studying ADHD and other neurodevelopmental conditions with a focus on genetics. Really swiftly, in terms of format this evening, uh, we'll have an opportunity for a Q&A at the end of the presentations. And if you have any questions, please enter them via the Q&A box, which you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, you can do so at any point once I utter the, those magic words and we'll get to as many questions as time allows. We finish at six o'clock, as I'm sure you will know. So I'd like to start by welcoming Stefan, Professor Stefan College. Over to you, Stefan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that introduction. And it's, it's a real pleasure to, to talk to you today. And I'm going to focus on one of the important questions that we'll be addressing in the Wolfson Centre for Young People's Mental Health. And it's focusing on trends in youth mental health. And in a very general sense, how have young people's mental health changed over time? And how is it different from children growing up in previous generations? And so why focus on young people's mental health? Well, the first thing to, to say is that mental health problems exist on a spectrum from mild through to severe. But even at, if we think about those mental health problems, which are, are former conditions such as anxiety, depression, or ADHD, these are very common, affecting at least one in 10 children and young people. And they take a variety of forms, emotional disorders, or, or conditions such as anxiety and depression, behavioral problems, as well as neurodevelopmental conditions such as, such as ADHD and autism. And these problems are, can be, are often very distressing to children, and young people and those around them and can are associated with important impairments on children's uh, development. 
Uh, importantly, they often don't occur in isolation and co-occurrence or comorbidity between different conditions is also very common. Mental health problems impact on children's lives at a critical stage in development uh, in terms of identity formation, uh, affecting friendships, family life, as well as educational opportunities and progress. Looking back from adulthood, it's striking that over three quarters of mental health problems have their origins in childhood and adolescence. And looking forwards, it's clear that child mental health problems can and often do have long lasting impacts with over 70% of child children with mental health problems continuing to have problems as adults, as well as broader impacts on employment, family life, social participation and physical health. So with that in mind, it's striking. This first thing I wanted to highlight uh, is a report from MQ published in 2016, uh, showing that there's a wide disparity in funding for research on mental health compared to other health conditions. And a critical question I want to ask today is whether youth mental health problems, children and adolescents mental health problems are showing, are on the increase. I'll start by showing you perhaps a popular view, or sort of, uh, if we look at the media, if we look at newspaper headlines, this is the view that we have. Uh, teenagers struck by depression epidemic, teenage mental health crisis, rates of depression have soared. Today's youth, anxious, depressed, antisocial, or the younger generation is depressed, why? Now you'll notice that not all of these headlines are from the last year or decade. In fact, some of these headlines go back over 40 years. So it's a pop, it has been and is a popular concern. And that brings me to what the evidence shows. And it's critical that we use robust evidence in evaluating trends in children and young people's mental health. And by that, I mean looking at representative epidemiological samples of children and young people at population level and comparing like with like when we look at measures of mental health taken a number of years apart. And this is research that I and, and others who work with me have been involved in for over 20 years and a clear consistent picture is emerging. I'm going to focus on evidence from the UK but similar data um, is, is, has emerged from a variety of other countries. And so in the UK uh, we now have three very good uh, representative epidemiological studies which have looked at children and young people's mental health in a lot of detail and have allowed us to estimate the rates of particular mental health conditions. And overall, around one in 10 children and young people meet criteria for mental health conditions. The rate of depression and anxiety in this age group has increased by around 50% between 2004 and 2017. And that's a striking increase. But what we've learned since COVID-19, the most recent data, follow-up 2017 survey shown here, shows that rates of difficulties have increased from around one in 10 children and young people experiencing a mental health condition to around one in six. And these trends haven't been uniform for and in fact, what we see is that this has particularly impacted on young women with especially high, high rates of mental health difficulties in 17 to 22 year olds with around one in four young women affected. So apart from questions around trends in the problems, another important question that my team has focused on uh, when thinking about trends in mental is what are the outcomes for children and young people who do experience mental health problems? And to do this, we've used longitudinal uh, UK population cohort data. And this is incredibly rare, and the UK is in, the, in a great position to have data like this, where we can look at um, longitudinal population cohorts and compare these across generations. And in our research, we focused on three cohorts, uh, children born in 1958, growing up in the 1960s and 70s, and children born more recently, the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children and the Millennium Cohort Study, growing up in the 1990s and 2000s. 
And we asked three questions. What are the social, educational, and mental health outcomes for children with mental health problems? And how have those outcomes changed from the earlier generation to the more recent cohorts? And finally, do outcomes differ for boys and girls? And this is a uh, research that was published uh, by Ruth Sellers and colleagues in 2019. So I'm going to show you three slides uh, with, with a very similar format, and in this case, focusing on social difficulties at age 11. So being bullied and experiencing social isolation. And in each case, what we're doing is we're comparing children with mental health problems at age seven with children without mental health problems at age seven. And what this graph shows you are odds ratios in terms of the risk associated with mental health difficulties in childhood in predicting these later outcomes. So you can see that uh, boys shown in blue um, and girls shown in orange in the 1960s experienced around a two-fold increased risk of social difficulties at age 11 if they had mental health problems at age seven. By the 2000s, in the more recent cohort, that risk associated with mental health difficulties at age seven had substantially increased. It was now associated with a fourfold increased risk of social difficulties at age 11. Next, we looked at educational outcomes and we compared children with relatively poor, or we looked at relatively poor educational attainment at age 16 uh, uh, for children with and without mental health problems again at age seven. And in the 1960s, boys and girls with mental health problems experienced around a twofold increased risk of poor educational uh, attainment exam results at age 16. And again, that risk had increased to around a threefold uh, risk associated with mental health problems for children growing up in the 2000s. And then finally, we looked at the persistence of mental health symptoms. Now uh, we're looking at effect sizes, statistical effect sizes rather than odds ratios. And again, the, the blue vertical line shows uh, a sort of null effect, and you can see there are substantial effects associated with mental health difficulties at age seven. Illust you know, it's um, capturing the continuity of mental health difficulties throughout childhood and adolescence. In the 1960s, there were substantial effect sizes both for boys and girls, but by the 2000s, those effect sizes had around doubled compared to the 1960s. So to capture the findings from this, not only have we found that rates of mental health problems affecting children and young people have become more common, but they're also associated with poorer outcomes than they have been in the past. And given the scale and the growing scale and urgency of this problem, then we need to ask what are the, the services and the supports that children and young people um, have available to them when they do experience difficulties with their mental health? And the first and perhaps most important point is that the majority of children and young people who have a mental health condition do not access services, nor do they receive effective support. And this is true even for those at the highest risk of the most severe difficulties. Secondly, and Joanna will talk about this more in terms of gender inequalities, it's clear that there are inequalities in access to mental health services and treatment. And this has particularly been a challenge since COVID-19 has hit, not just because of the increased uh, need for, for mental health care for children and young people, but also because of the difficulties in providing effective support uh, in, 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 in the last year and a half. Um, as a centre, the Wolfson Centre will be focusing on a number of uh, key issues here. First of all, in terms of what can we do to prevent uh, mental health difficulties arising in the first place? What are the most important causal risk and protective factors here? And we also need to be thinking more generally, what are the services that can be provided at community level, whether it's schools or primary care, uh, to help and support uh, the many young people who need effective mental health support? And finally, it's really important to acknowledge that specialist care is also important to support and, and effectively fund for those with the most severe needs and complex needs. So to summarise, um, our research has shown that children's mental health problems are associated with major long-lasting impacts, both for young people themselves, as well as for those around them, their families, their schools, their communities. 
Um, there's robust evidence of an increase in the prevalence of mental health problems uh, affecting children and young people, with some suggestions that this is particularly true uh, for, for young women. Um, outcomes for children with mental health difficulties have deteriorated over time, and many young people lack effective mental health. So in terms of our future research directions, I wanted to sort of uh, talk about these uh, briefly because they're going to form one important part of the Wolfson Center's work. We will be focusing on trying to understand what factors explain these trends in young people's work. And then numerous suggestions and, and possibilities here. Um, for example, in terms of lifestyle, we need to understand how the marked changes in sleep, and exercise, diet, social media use and so forth, changes in lifestyle how these have impacted on children's mental health. We also need to understand how family life has changed and how changes in family stress, parental mental health, or parent-child relationships might be related to trends in children's mental health. Similarly, we need to understand how social relationships have changed, friendships, uh, exposure to bullying and cyberbullying, uh, experiences of social isolation. Fourth, the school environment is, is crucially important. Uh, uh, one specific example here is the suggestion that children growing up today are more likely to experience test anxiety or exam stress, and that this might be linked to challenges in terms of mental health. And then finally, I haven't had the chance to, to provide you the, the sort of more detailed data on this, uh, but there are, there's good evidence now that inequalities in mental health have also increased over time, and that social exclusion and poverty uh, likely play an important role. In addition, we need to ask more general questions around how can we build resilience uh, in children and young people uh, to, to buffer children and young people against the risks and the stresses they experience to, to, to boost their mental health, and how do we improve long-term outcomes for children and young people who do develop mental health. And then finally, in the context of COVID, I think it's really important to understand whether the consequences of the impacts of the pandemic are short-lived or maybe long-lasting. So many thanks, Jochen Vau. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Joanna. I've given a brief general overview around, around children and young people's mental health. Joanna is going to talk about a particular condition in some more detail. She will highlight the importance of considering gender differences here in terms of young people's mental health, focusing particularly on ADHD. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan, for that introduction. Just share my slides. So as Stefan mentioned, I'll be talking about my research on ADHD in young people. So ADHD is a common neurodevelopmental condition which affects about one in 20 young people. It's characterized by severe and develop developmentally impairing symptoms in two domains, inattention and hyperactivity and impulsivity. In order to get a diagnosis according to our two diagnostics manuals, DSM-5 or ICD-10, Symptoms need to be present in childhood and need to be present across settings, typically in the home and school environment. ADHD is really an umbrella term for several very related conditions. The most common subtype is the combined subtype, which is characterized by difficulties in both of the domains. We also have the predominantly inattentive subtype, which is also sometimes known as ADD, and the predominantly hyperactive impulsive subtype. What's particularly interesting to me is that ADHD is very heritable, which means that genetic factors are particularly important in its etiology. It's also polygenic, which means that there isn't one single gene associated with ADHD, but actually there's evidence that there's thousands, if not tens of thousands of genetic factors which are linked to ADHD. Individuals with ADHD often have continued difficulties with their symptoms into adulthood. And this condition often does not occur alone. It tends to be associated with other neurodevelopmental conditions, including autism or learning difficulties, various neuropsychological impairments, including executive functioning difficulties like working memory difficulties, and also mental health problems, including anxiety, depression, and substance misuse. Affected individuals also continue to have problems throughout their lives often, including difficulties with education, criminality, unemployment, and problems with relationships. And they also have general health problems, including difficulties like suicide and accidents as well. ADHD, as I mentioned, is very common. About one in 20 children globally are affected. According to an English, England NHS survey in England, in, in children between the ages of five to 19, about 2.6% of boys are affected and only about 0.6% of girls. 
And this is less than the 5% prevalence rate of ADHD that is seen globally. So that suggests that there might be some underdiagnosis of ADHD in the UK. But what's also very apparent is that boys are much more likely to be diagnosed than girls. When we look at clinical studies of children who have actually been diagnosed, there are between seven to eight boys diagnosed for every girl. When we look at community samples where we screen all children for meeting diagnostic criteria for ADHD, we see a smaller ratio between about three to four boys diagnosed for every girl. This suggests that there's a lot of girls in the community who are not getting diagnosed, not getting to clinics. We also know that ADHD diagnosis is often delayed in girls. This is a graph looking at data from Denmark of incidence rate of ADHD diagnosis in children up to the age of 18. And what you can see here is that there's this peak in diagnoses in boys in early childhood around age seven and eight. And in girls, this peak occurs later on in adolescence around age 17, illustrating this delay in diagnosis. Even when girls are diagnosed with ADHD, they're less likely to be prescribed stimulant medication. And this is even the case when they have the severe symptoms, just as severe as boys who are getting prescribed stimulant medicine. We know ADHD medication is only one kind of treatment for ADHD, but it can be effective in girls as well as boys. And it's been shown to improve outcomes, both in terms of educational and occupational outcomes, as well as reducing risks, for example, from accidents or criminality or suicide. So this inequality and timely access to diagnosis and clinical care and treatment will have negative consequences on girls with ADHD. But why are they less likely to be diagnosed? Well, this is, this is a complex issue and there'll probably be many different explanations, but some of them include the fact that the diagnostic criteria are based on studies from the 80s and 90s of majority male samples. So it's possible that the symptoms of ADHD that are particularly typical of girls might not be as well captured by these symptoms as the symptoms present in boys. We also know that inattentive difficulties are more, more common in girls, and these symptoms, compared to hyperactive impulsive symptoms, are less disruptive to others and can be more easily missed. Girls who do get a diagnosis of ADHD do tend to have more of the hyperactive impulsive subtypes and often associated conduct difficulties, including things like fighting and stealing, which bring them more to clinical attention. We also know that parents and teachers do have gendered expectations of children's behavior. In an interesting study where parents and teachers were shown children's vignettes about their behavior with either boys' names and pronouns or girls' names and pronouns, they said that they'd be less likely to seek services and clinical referral for ADHD in girls compared to boys with the same exact behaviors. Anxiety and mood problems, as Stefan already mentioned, are more common in girls. And so there can be diagnostic masking or overshadowing when a girl is diagnosed with anxiety and mood problems, neurodevelopmental conditions that are underlying that may not be noticed. Sorry, just into the next slides. That just jumped too far ahead. I'll go back. There we go. So together with researchers in several international um, institutions, including in Sweden, Denmark, and the States, I set out to address the issue of whether we can learn anything from genetic studies about ADHD in girls. So one of the questions we addressed is whether ADHD is the same condition genetically in boys and girls. And we compared DNA samples from nearly 5,000 girls and over 14,000 boys with ADHD. And we found that to a very large extent, the same con common genetic risk factors were implicated in ADHD in boys and girls suggesting that we are diagnosing the same biological condition. Second question we addressed is whether there is a higher genetic burden of risk factors for ADHD in girls compared to boys. And if some, in some way girls are protected from developing ADHD and require this greater genetic risk. So the way we tested this was looking at siblings. If a girl with ADHD has a higher genetic risk for ADHD, we would expect her family members to also have a slightly higher risk compared to the siblings of affected males. And in fact, when we looked at the Swedish population and we identified 78,000 people who had a diagnosis of ADHD, we found that in this sample, siblings of girls with ADHD were at higher risk of having ADHD themselves, supporting this hypothesis. However, when we looked at DNA in children with ADHD, we did not find any differences in common polygenic risk factors or rare variant risk factors in boys and girls. So we only found partial support for this hypothesis. We're also interested in looking at shared genetic effects across ADHD and other conditions because we do know that there are these shared risks. So we asked the question of whether girls who are at risk of having ADHD in terms of their genetics might actually be getting diagnosed with another condition, for example, anxiety or depression. And in a series of studies, we addressed this question. 
Looking at data from the child and adolescent twin study in Sweden, which is a general population sample, we found that in children who had a diagnosis of anxiety or depression, girls had more genetic risk factors related to ADHD than boys, supporting our hypothesis. We also looked at data from Sweden from the National Patient Register, looking at sibling pairs, including over 150,000 pairs, and we found that in the sample, women who had a diagnosis of anxiety were more likely to have a brother who had a diagnosis of ADHD, suggesting they had a greater family history or genetic burden for ADHD. We also looked at data from the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium Major Depressive Disorder Sample, and we found that in individuals who had early onset depression, women had higher genetic risk for ADHD compared to men. But we did not find this when we looked at later onset depression, suggesting that there's something about early onset or perhaps early life that might be working here. And we also, in other studies, looked at di uh, minimizing diagnostic bias, so screening a population of children for anxiety and depression. And when we did that, we did not see these sex differences in terms of the genetics, which does suggest that there might be diagnostic referral biases in these real life um, register-based diagnoses that could be explaining what we see. So just to summarize, ADHD may be diagnosed late or possibly even underdiagnosed in women and girls, and they might be missing out on help with their ADHD. According to some of the genetic research that I've done with colleagues, we find that ADHD is biologically similar in boys and girls, but the, and there's some weak evidence that girls might require a higher burden of genetic risk to develop ADHD. We find stronger evidence for the possibility that young women who are at genetic risk for ADHD actually end up manifesting or being diagnosed with different conditions, including anxiety and depression. This is further supported by some work by my colleagues at Cardiff University who looked at the UK Biobank data and looked at individuals, middle-aged adults, and, the, and whether they had depression or not. And they found that rare neuropsychiatric genetic risks that have previously been linked to conditions like autism were associated with depression in women in particular. So together this work suggests that there might be diagnostic and referral biases which could be leading to anxiety and depression diagnoses in girls and might explain the prevalence differences that we see. So there's a gap in diagnosis and clinical care. And I just want to highlight, this isn't specific to ADHD, there are similar issues that have been identified in autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. And we really need more funding to look at this issue in terms of young women with ADHD and other neurodevelopmental disorders. So some of the questions I'm interested in asking in future um, and Cardiff are looking at what pathways and barriers there actually are to getting an ADHD diagnosis in girls and what the impact of having a delayed diagnosis is on one's mental health and future life outcomes. And I would hope that this research would help to improve clinical services and treatment for young women and young men with ADHD. And I'd just like to thank all my colleagues, collaborators and funders, and thank you very much for listening. Great, many thanks. Thank you um, so much both. Uh, He's such an urgent and timely and emotive in many ways, as I can see already from um, questions in the uh, in the Q&A um, tool um, on our screens um, area of research and we're proud that Cardiff is taking a research lead through um, both our colleagues in this area so let me open the Q&A session now and, and as I said if you haven't done so already please post your question via the Q&A facility there um, as you get warmed up I will start if I may with some questions submitted in advance um, and here's one is there a link between the grow, and this is a really very interesting question. Is there a link between the growing number of children with mental health difficulties and their rising awareness of wiser global issues? Very interesting one. Um, who would like to take that? I'm, I'm happy to take it. I mean, I think the, uh, I think it's really important that we recognise that children and young people have always been in some sense, worried about and, and aware of the, you know, wider social issues and, and those social issues are changing. In my view, uh, one thing in particular that may have changed is that whereas in the past, children and young people may have been exposed to, sort of, you know, bad news and disasters and traumas via the news in, in their living rooms with their parents and families around them, uh, they would have had more of an opportunity to talk those things through. And today, often, that, that, that exposure happens in 
in private, in, in bedrooms, via, via the internet, etc. And I think that's an important thing to be thinking about. Um, it's, it's a difficult question to answer in terms of research, but I think it's a very good question. Thanks, Stefan. Um, it's interesting the the you historicize um, obviously young young people's mental health and that's that's crucial, isn't it? It's it's fascinating to to contextualize different responses and the availability of help and um, the possibility of dialogue and and communication yeah. with parents and guardians. Um, here's another one: as parents and guardians, are there early signs of mental health conditions that we can be looking out for? Joanna. Yeah, um, I'm, I can try to take a stab at that. I'm not a clinician, I'm a researcher, but I guess one of the things that um, would be uh, something to look at for is a sort of sudden change in the child's behavior, if they sort of stop enjoying the things that they normally enjoy, if they don't sleep well, if they don't want to see their friends, that kind of thing. Um, but I would say that um, every child's different, parents know their children best, and if they have any concerns, they need to talk to their GP or talk to um, teachers to see what their behavior is like in school. Okay, thanks, Joanna. Um, here's one, another one for you, if I may, Joanna. Um, and this dovetails with some of the questions coming up um, on the Q and A as well. Um, some shock at the difference between um, the diagnosis of girls and and boys. Um, the the data are as they are, and as we said, they are something shocking in that. Um, what's the what's the evidence of the impact on girls' long-term outcomes, given that disparity? So um, this is something I'm very interested in, and um, unfortunately there's not a huge amount of data. We do know that individuals who do not get ADHD medication or um, aren't getting treatment for their ADHD do have worse outcomes than individuals with ADHD who do. So presumably individuals who have a delay in receiving clinical care will have worse outcomes, but I think this does need to be studied further. Um, in, in terms of what we know things from other neurodevelopmental conditions, for example, autism, there's been studies to suggest that individuals who have a delayed diagnosis um, tend to be more likely to have depression or self-harming. So we may see the same thing in ADHD, we may not. I think the research needs to be done, um, but it is definitely an issue of concern and I think it does need to be studied further. Another question submitted, and then I'll, I'll get to um, the one submitted uh, in real time today. Um, can either of you expand on your thinking about how adverse childhood experiences um, have impacted on, on young people's mental health? It's a big question, obviously, and um, adverse childhood experiences is a range of, covers a range of experiences, but can you reflect a little on that? to take that i think it's it's really important to recognize that that children's experiences both good and bad impact on their mental health and uh it's it's long been recognized that the rates of uh mental health difficulties are particularly increased in 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 high risk groups children who've experienced for example uh, maltreatment uh, poverty uh, traumas uh, bereavement and and I think it's it's important then to think not only about those risk factors but also the protective factors that might play a role in buffering children from those stresses and the Early Intervention Foundation who we partner with at the centre have done some excellent work around adverse childhood experiences and sort of you, you know as a review of the literature and, and recommendations for policy and practice here and one of the things they highlight is that the term ACEs or adverse childhood experiences traditionally has had a relatively narrow focus and we need to be thinking quite broadly about the kinds of adversities that, that, that children commonly experience and that might impact on their mental health. Thanks, Stefan. Um, a question about um, teachers. Um, in your experience, do are teachers given sufficient training to deal with this? Is that directed to me, David? Uh, either of you, St Stefan, since you're live, do you want to take that one? I'm happy to take it. I think uh, particularly in Wales, we now have the um, 
we have a new mental health policy of, uh, around schools and the whole schools approach, which puts mental health and well-being at the heart of the of the agenda. And I think there's a real opportunity to improve uh, awareness and training uh, for everyone who works in, in in schools with children and young people, um, not just teachers, but everyone in the school community. And that that's something that uh, colleagues in Decipher. First, um, so Murphy, Graham Moore and their team have done a huge amount of work on. Um, so I'd recommend those who are interested in looking at that in more detail. A question about the Wolfson Centre, very interesting one. Um, we mentioned the fact that uh, the Wolfson Centre will be located in, in Spark and all the research entities in Cardiff University are located in Spark. Um, pride themselves on having um, policy impact. Um, how is the work conducted in Walton, and that will be conducted um, in the Walton Centre, how will it influence policymakers? Through what kind of channels and what kind of timescales um, are we talking about there? Difficult to judge, I know, but um, does either of you want to talk about uh, Wilson and policy change? I suppose I should take that one. Um, I think the, uh, I, I mean, one of the sort of, when we applied for funding from the Wilson Foundation, one of the sort of, guiding sort of uh, principles of the, the funding was that it has demonstrable impacts in, in a relatively short space of time, that the research has real life impact. And when we set up the centre, we were really keen to um, think about how we can draw connections with those who make a difference, whether that's uh, Welsh government, whether that's schools, the third sector as well, and crucially young people themselves and, and how to bring those together. Um, so then a number of different channels and ways which we hope that this will happen. Uh, for example, we have a joint funded first of its kind, uh, I think, in, in the research I've been involved in, at least, a joint funded post with Welsh Government, who will work both in the Wolfson Centre and in Welsh Government uh, to improve those channels of communication to make sure that the research questions we address are ones that are relevant to policy, but also that policy is informed by our research. So that would be one uh, specific example. But I think on the ground, I think it's really important that um, we think more broadly than, than, than policymakers and academics, and that this in, brings together everyone in, in the community who is interested in children, young people's mental health. The, the last thing I think I would say in Wales, we're in a, I think, quite unique position with the research infrastructure that we have through uh, the Schools Health Research Network, which includes every secondary, mainstream secondary school in Wales, every patient in Wales via the uh, secure anonymized information linkage platform, uh, where we can actually use that data to not just influence, uh, to generate evidence to influence policy, but to actually evaluate the impacts that policy changes have on children and young people's mental health and wellbeing. Um, question for Joanna um, on labels. Um, clearly, we need we need labels, um, but labels change um, over time. They are themselves um, historicizable, um, aren't they? Uh, ADHD is one such. Um, what's the value of labels? Do in your experience, how do they help us define? Are they helpful for those who are suffering from mental health disorders? For whom are labels val valuable? Um, well, labels are useful in multiple contexts, one being the medical context. Um, treatment decisions have to be binary. You either do start someone on medication or you don't start someone on medication. So having a label to help decide on that is important. There's also um, the sort of social aspect of having a label in terms of identity. There's a growing neurodiversity movement of um, individuals seeing their neurodevelopmental or neurodiverse um, behaviors as uh, part of their identity, which I think is very important to many individuals. So they're, they're multifaceted and I think they, they can be very helpful. Of course, we do have to consider stigma, but I hope that things are slowly changing in a more positive direction like that. Okay, thanks, Joanna. Um, and then two more, I think, or maybe we'll have time for, for three or four. But, um, let me start with, um, something that's been in the news recently in, in Wales. Um, a very, very interesting question. 
does physical punishment of children increase the risk of mental health illness? What, what does the evidence show on the review? I think the uh, it's 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 not it's not uh, a research area of particular that I have particular expertise in, but I think it's quite clear that um, that parenting plays an important role in mental health, and that harsh parenting is associated with greater mental health dif difficulties. Um, that. I guess the, the 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 context in which it happens can play a role, um, and but that the the that physical punishment and its association with mental health uh, can vary across different families and different uh, for different children and different families. Um, I think it's an important question. I think, regardless of whether there's a the, whether there is and the extent of the causal link between physical punishment and um, children's mental health, uh, my personal view would be that I think we want to live in a society where physical punishment is, 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 is reduced as a way of parenting our children. Well said. Um, a question about, um, we talked about gender differences, Joanna, you, you highlighted that they were stark and, um, and shocking, as I said, in, in, in many ways. What about cultural differences and cultural barriers? Um, have any of these come up in, in your research in relation to the difficulty of diagnosing, the difficulty of treatment, the difficulty of coming forward for treatment? Um, that's a, it's, it's, it's a complex area, I know, but cultural differences as well as gender um, differences. Does either of you want to respond on, on that, Joanna? Um, well, so I'll just say that I, I do think this is a very important issue, but it's not something that I've personally studied, but I think the intersection between culture cultural um, identity and ethnicity and gender and sex is also very important to study. We know that there are um, important factors to consider there. So it's not something I know very much about though. Stefan, do you want to jump in with anything? Or? Again, I think it, 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 it's not um, a research topic of mine particularly, but I think in terms of trends, what we're seeing is that um, the, the trends in mental health are, are reasonably kind of replicable across different cultures, social groups, um, ethnicities, different countries. One caveat there is that we know very little about trends in low and middle income countries. I think in the UK, I think in terms of cultural identity and ethnicity, I think it's really important that we also think about access to services and how um, that how how we remove barriers and reduce stigma around mental health access for every for all, all children who need mental health support. Okay, thank you. And uh, we're we're coming up to um, to the end of our time, but there is one interesting question here. And if I can uh, direct it to you, Stefan, and ask you to keep it brief, Wilson, um, and the wonderful work that you've been profiling, both of you coming out of Wilson. How is it unique? In other words, what is distinctive to the work done in Wilson that is not happening in other research centres in the UK or internationally? I think one really a unique and important aspect of this is the way it's, it maximises the, the, the value of research in Wales, uh, which in many ways is unique, this re unique research infrastructure capturing the whole population. I think the other, uh, I'm not sure if it is unique or not, but I think we very much focus on cross-disciplinary research, bringing together um, scientists and experts with, from a wide range of disciplines, from genetics, through psychology, through psychiatry, through to social sciences. And I think that's another really important aspect of our work. It's a lovely place to end with, with Cardiff interdisciplinarity highlighted. Um, we're out of time in Iwidi Karadi Wedem Taith and Anfodis. Can I thank Stefan and Joanna for their insight and of course you as the webinar audience for being with us. I hope you've found it engaging and urgent as um, it definitely is. Um, if we didn't get a chance to answer your question specifically, we'll follow up um, with you on that. Um, just to say some housekeeping in the next 15 seconds. Our next event in the series is taking place on the 26th of October. 
and that is looking at uh, a new surgical treatment for delivering chemotherapy that we are pioneering at Cardiff. Um, important message finally, if anybody watching would like to get involved with Cardiff University, this kind of work, volunteering time to help our students or researchers or fundraise, of course, for our research, we are popping a link in the comments box for you now. That's, um, Rose is doing that as we speak, thank you. And finally, finally, just to say that you'll receive an email in the next few days with a copy of the recording and links to register for upcoming events. We hope to be welcoming you back very soon for the next one. Many thanks and have an excellent evening.